I want you to close your eyes. Please cooperate. Imagine you're in your home. You're studying for your math exam, reviewing your multiplication skills around the age of nine. Then suddenly, the electricity turns off. Your mom enters the room and lights the candle. And then you hear strong shots coming from the outside. Bang, the first one. And the second and the third follow. You look outside the window, and you notice some buildings have been demolished. But you continue on reviewing for your exam as if nothing had happened. Open your eyes. How did this make you feel? Were you scared? Were you suddenly traumatized for these few seconds? Well, this is just a glimpse of what many of the refugees around the world have to encounter every single day, or what they have experienced at some point in their lives. I'm here to talk about the refugee crisis. And this crisis is a crisis that's going to continue on in our future generations. There are over 68.5 million refugees around the world from different parts. Latin America, the Middle East, even in the United States, Europe, and in Africa. And this crisis is going to dictate our future generations. This crisis is revealing some negative and very negative thoughts about who we are and what we stand for. We live in such an ignorant and privileged society that we forget to take care of our fellow human beings, even though we teach kids at school to be compassionate and caring. But yet we let countries put refugees into dangerous situations, putting them in impoverished places where they don't have any access to quality life, education, and health care. And it is going to take more than empathy to move forward because this is involving all of us. Now before I talk about things we can do to help these people, I'd like to talk about how I became so passionately involved in this topic. My freshman year, I thought that if I just majored in neuroscience, studied for the MCATs, and then got into medical school, I would be automatically successful and happy. But life didn't turn out to be that way. Life brought me closer to people of different countries, different cultures, and different backgrounds. And soon this inspired me to travel to different places around the world. So my freshman summer, I actually decided to travel to Spain, Ireland, and Morocco by myself. But then sophomore year, my life changed. Sophomore year, my grades were plummeting. My mental health was not the best. I was questioning the relationships I had, my self-worth, and even my major. And so this summer, I wanted to have a fresh start. And I met three Palestinians, one from Gaza, one from the West Bank, and the other now lives in Jordan. And they personally inspired me to travel to Palestine and further understand the refugee population. And so for three weeks, I went to Palestine, and I volunteered in two camps, Askar camp and Balata camp. And then my volunteering journey didn't end here. I then decided to travel to Lebanon and volunteer for three weeks as well during the cold winter and help out with the food distribution. And it was very difficult to not have any expectations, especially from social media. But I tried really hard. I remember the first time I stepped into Balata camp that houses over 30,000 Palestinian refugees. It was overwhelming. I saw the graffiti on the wall saying, we want our home back, peace, and liberty. And then I couldn't ignore the smell of trash and urine coming from, leaking from houses and the narrow walkways where kids had to run past. And also the sheep and the animals on the first floor from previous farmers. But then this pain changed as soon as I walked into a refugee home. At the front door, I was greeted with a, by a mother who welcomed me and asked me if I wanted tea. And she even cooked dinner for me and the other volunteers. I was shocked. And I was also touched. Because despite their economic and political situation, they still wanted me and the rest of the volunteers to feel like we were part of their family and part of their home. And so this mother shared to us the the generations that have grown up in the refugee camps and described how all she wants is just international support. But she also still has hope. She just wants the rest of the world 
to understand her, listen to her, and give her a chance to succeed. Contrary to what people believe, I do not see refugees as helpless or worthless. I see them with powerful qualities that makes them beautiful and unique. I see determination, resilience, love, and a strong sense of community. Some qualities that even in our society today we have lost. So the first thing to fix this crisis is to understand what it means to be a refugee. A refugee during a time of political and economic turmoil has only three options. One, they can remain in their home when they're at risk of losing their own lives or putting their families in danger. Two, move to an alternating country where they're treated as second-class citizens. Or three, settle in a camp. Let's say you're a refugee from Syria and you decided to move to Lebanon. These are the conditions that you will live in where barely a carpet separates you and the ground, and a thin layer of wood, tires and sheets, sustains your home. And you might ask, well, can I get a better job? Can I get an education? It's not that simple. Many Syrians in Lebanon are denied any type of opportunity. And so I met a father in Lebanon who only relies on $20 a monthly salary to pay for food, rent, and transportation for his family members, which include his grandparents, his children, and his grandchildren. And if you walk outside your home, you see floods. You're constantly more exposed to contaminated water flooding your home, containing disease, bacteria, and hazardous chemicals. And if you're a Palestinian refugee, you have to construct your home on top of others because you're not given a permit to buy land or to buy a home for your family. The second thing we need to do is to change our perspectives of, of what we think of refugees. Refugees are just like us. They have passions, they have dreams, they have families, and they have community. Oftentimes, we're bombarded by media channels claiming that they're animals or that they're here to take over our jobs, when this is not the case. In our own country, we even affiliate Middle Easterns to terrorist groups just because they are different, because they practice different religions or they have a different accent and speak a different language. How have we become this flow? What I saw in the refugees was a strong sense of community something that I'm not taught in my school courses. In the, food distribution that I, in the food distribution that I participated in Lebanon, not only would volunteer help out with the food distribution, also Syrian refugees themselves. They would make sure that every family member in the camp got food and oil for the cold winter. Another program in the NGO that I worked with was actually developed by a Syrian refugee himself, who designed an educational program to make sure that the kids wouldn't, be, wouldn't fall behind in academics. But the creative part about this is he actually brought the classroom inside of school bus because he couldn't get a permit elsewhere. And so now, the kids are able to take Arabic courses and technology courses. Because it wasn't until a year ago that many Syrian children were able to go to schools. Imagine being at the age of 16 and illiterate, not knowing anything about your favorite subjects now. Another quality I find in these refugees is love. They want to spread their love. We designed a program to bring recreational activities to the camps during the winter. We played games with the kids. And all the families would gather around, cheer their kids on, and also make sure that the volunteers were participating. And resilience. Most refugees that I met abroad are extremely overqualified. I met refugees with medical engineering degrees, but are now working as taxi drivers because they are just not giving the right support or the right opportunities to succeed. 
even Syrian kids who have PTSD, have come together to create artworks, sharing their thoughts and their creativity, despite the trauma that they've lived in their lives. I think we can all learn something from them, and we can all admire something from them. But it is time we work together. So the last thing I want you to do, I want us to do, is to take action. We cannot cross our fingers and hope that political powers are going to make change. It is time we do something ourselves. We live in a generation where we're exposed to so much technology, so much information, and we have the ability to get an education and to fight for these people. I'm not saying you need to go to Lebanon or Palestine and travel there and volunteer. All I'm saying is to do something and do it with your heart. You can even start an NGO, volunteer, look up organizations abroad here in the United States that work together with refugees across the world. If you're an engineer, design a product that's going to make change. If you're a doctor, volunteer one month in the refugee camp. Or if you're studying psychology, help out kids that have PTSD and their family members too. Because when I was abroad, I met kids starting at the ages from 8 to 16 years old smoking packs of cigarettes every single day. And I was the one that had to turn it down. My personal goal is to raise money and purchase educational supplies for the refugee camps I've worked in, in Palestine and in Lebanon. Because education is a right, not a privilege. My overall goal is to become a physician and work in the camps. Because in, in the meantime, I will continue to advocate for these people. Because who am I to say that I want peace and I believe in peace when I don't do anything to fight for it? Now, the, re the main reason why I think I can relate so well to these people and really admire them is from my background as a Mexican immigrant. In Mexico, we have this idea that the American dream is going to grant you automatic opportunity and success. But it's not that easy. I remember coming in the United States, I was always discriminated by how I looked, my accent, and my roots but I had to do it. I had to stay here and fight for my family, and especially for my father, who at the age of 18, he crossed the Sonora Desert to provide a better life for his family and to save money for his college education. And so my dad taught me an important lesson growing up. He said, La montaña que cruzas por tu familia no tiene fin. The mountain you cross for your family has no end. And in honor of his words, I would like to have my family and my brothers and sisters who are related to me and those who are not. From this experience, my family tree has expanded tremendously, and I have learned important lessons that I would never learn here in school. And so I think it's time we create a community that's more diverse, more accepting to different races and religions and practices and different backgrounds. We need to progress for a better future, and I can't do it alone. So I hope you can join me too. Thank you.